Well, good morning, Madison. It's great to see you guys this morning. Why don't we take some time and greet one another around you this morning?
This week, we are starting a series in the Gospel of John that focuses on seven really important sayings of Jesus that John records for us. And it's so often the case when Jesus is speaking in the Gospels, uh, the passage that we're going to read today will have really important context in the Old Testament that you, you need to know to understand what Jesus is saying and the conversation that he has with the, with the people who he's speaking to. So we need to talk about manna. Manna was something that God gave to the Israelites when they were wandering in the, il- in the wilderness. No, in the wilderness. Uh, so manna first appears in, in Exodus 16. The Israelites have left Egypt, and they're wandering through the wilderness on their way to Sinai, and they, they realize, like, hey, we're going to need some food out here. 
And God said that he's going to provide for him. And God gives them manna, which is like flakes of bread that settle on the ground with the dew every day. They can collect the manna and, and they can eat it, but they're only allowed to have enough for that day. On Friday, the day before the Sabbath, they could gather twice as much, uh, and, and, but only then, only enough for two days. And each new day, they had to depend on God for this manna. And while the Israelites were in the wilderness, God continually provided for them by giving them bread daily. Daily, he was giving them bread. God was their provider, and, and this was really important to them. They needed it to survive, and it becomes a special icon in their relationship with God. Manna becomes especially important. In fact, manna is one of the few things that gets put inside the Ark of the Covenant that is kept inside the tabernacle and, and the temple is this jar of manna to signify the time when God provided daily for the Israelites what they needed to eat. And when they trusted God to do so for him, for them. Uh, so now that we've had a refresher on manna, we're ready to address the passage that we'll cover today in John 6. If you want to open there with me in your Bibles. Seven times in John's account of Jesus' life, he tells people, Jesus tells people who he is using the words, I am. Now, there's a reason that these statements about Jesus only appear in the Gospel of John. That is because of the way the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are formatted. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are writing in such a way as, as to give the readers an inductive introduction to Jesus. So as you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, little by little, you're learning who Jesus is and what he is capable of little by little, until it reaches this climactic moment, really at the end of Jesus' Galilean ministry, where he's able to ask his disciples, do you know who I am? Who do people say that I am? And of course, Peter answers correctly. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from that moment, Jesus then turns to Jerusalem. In those Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the only time he goes to Jerusalem as an adult, is here at the very end of his ministry where he will give his life on the cross and rise from the dead. So these gospel writers are portraying Jesus' story in a way that, that slowly introduces the reader to who Jesus is. Progressively, you learn more and more about him until you're ready to understand that he is the Christ. John's gospel is written much differently. John's gospel can't even be bothered to tell us the story of his birth because he's too busy telling us from the very beginning exactly who Jesus is and what he was here to do. Right? If, you, if you look at John 1, you'll see how different it is than the rest of the Gospels in that regard. So when John's writing, he starts right from the very beginning. This is Jesus. This is who he was. This is what he was here to do. And so because John has already spilled the beans in chapter 1, then all throughout the rest of the Gospel, he's... he's able to record for us these words of Jesus where he speaks explicitly to his audience and to the disciples about who he is and what he came here to do. That's why the Gospel of John records these seven statements about, about Jesus. We're going to be looking at John chapter 6, verses 25 through 29 today. But before we get there, it will be crucially important for us to understand what has happened just before that passage. Jesus has been ministering in Galilee, performing miracles and teaching. He has attracted a huge crowd. Crowd big enough where the men number 5,000 and the total number of people would have been much higher than that still. At the beginning of John 6, Jesus recognizes a problem. That these people are going to need to eat. Andrew brings a boy with five small loaves and two small fish, and, and Jesus feeds the crowd with them. And there's plenty left over. It's, it's one of the great miracles of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000, something you probably learned about in Sunday school. What you should know is, is about how crucial food was to these people. Food represented a much more urgent need for them uh, because of the, the share it occupied of their budget. Uh, one New Testament commentator, D.A. Carson, uh, I read this week, he estimated that 85% of the, 
of a person's budget in Jesus' time, of an Israelite in Galilee, 85% of their budget was food. That's a lot. And so when Jesus feeds this multitude of people, he is supplying them a significant financial benefit. He is providing for them in a very significant way, uh, one that to them would have been extremely enticing. And do you know what doesn't happen? What we don't see recorded in the Gospels about the feeding of the 5,000? We don't ever record here Jesus saying, just this one meal and I'm done, guys. <laughs> it's like, don't come back tomorrow because there's there not going to be any more baskets full of food. No, he, he just feeds them a meal. They eat it. There's plenty of left over. But what happens after this meal? What happens at the end of the day? Jesus does something that, that's a little bit cruel. He up and leaves. <laughs> he feeds this huge crowd of people, and they're thinking, this is great. This guy can give us food. We need food desperately. Food is an incredibly important thing that we have to worry about every day, and he can provide it for us. Now, where is he? I'm hungry. He's gone. <laughs> He's gone to the other side of the lake. And, of course, in, in Jesus' fashion, he has to do it very dramatically. He walks across the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the lake. But this is the situation that, or, that we find when we begin this passage. Jesus has fed these people, and then he disappeared. And these people are going to run into Jesus again. We'll see what happens. But I, I was thinking, just this morning, I had a situation a little similar to this that I want to share with you. Okay. Uh, in the teenage Sunday school class, we usually have an extra snack that you guys don't have access to, right? So during Sunday school, we're eating food because I figure this is what the teens want, right? This is what you guys want, right? Yes, we, they want to eat food. So we have special food in there that we're eating during Sunday school. It's too bad you can't come unless you're a teenager. And, uh, but every once in a while, Marky will make these cinnamon rolls that we all love. This happens like a few times a year. It is always a very special Sunday. It's cinnamon roll Sunday. And this morning when I woke up, I saw the cinnamon rolls rising. And I took a picture. I sent it to some teenagers in the class. I was, uh, I was telling Nathan this morning during rehearsal, like, hey, it's cinnamon roll Sunday. And we got everybody all excited. Then uh, we did the opener with the kids. I sat down. I'm ready for cinnamon rolls. I went to look for them in the kitchen. All I found was the lid to the pan. Come to find out that one of my children, Henry, <laughs> was tasked with carrying this pan of cinnamon rolls across the church. And he made it about halfway before he dropped the pan onto the road and the glass pan shattered and sprinkled our cinnamon rolls with glass. So they had to be thrown away. So look, we've been providing for food for these kids, and I had texted many of them this morning and saying, hey, it's cinnamon roll Sunday, you better come to church. And here they are, ready for cinnamon roll Sunday, and I have the burden of telling them, sorry guys, no cinnamon rolls today. But, no, it wasn't. It wasn't just a sermon illustration, and I don't think that's why Henry dropped the pan. <laughs> but let me tell you what I did. I, when I was out there looking for the pan, I did not see Marky. And so I thought, maybe she is at home preparing a backup option for us, for the cinnamon rolls. And uh, she was not the one who told me that Henry dropped the pan, so she doesn't know that I know that the cinnamon rolls are broken. So here's my hope. My hope was that she would come through for us anyways. <laughs> so I just texted her a question, cinnamon rolls, question mark. I was hoping that maybe we would get fed regardless. Uh, my hopes were dashed to pieces when she said, yeah, Henry, drop them. You're not having anything today. <laughs> but when we start reading, the the crowd that was fed by Jesus the day before is going to be in a similar situation to me when I was texting Marky, cinnamon rolls, question mark. Like, is this going to happen or not? So let's pick up here reading in verse 25 of John chapter 6. 
When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. That is a funny way to start a conversation. These people asked Jesus, how did you get here? And did you hear Jesus answer their question? <laughs> he did not. Because Jesus is not concerned with answering their question. He's concerned with answering what they really came here for. Jesus doesn't even tell them how he got there, even though it's a pretty fascinating story. He says, I know why you're talking to me. You want more food. <laughs> He's going to try, with minimal success at first, to redirect their attention, starting in verse 27. There we read, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do, uh, I'm sorry, what must we do to do the works of God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus says, you need to believe in the one he sent. He tells them, hey, don't worry about food that spoils. I can give you better food. He says, believe in me. And, and they ask him something crazy. They say, give us a sign. Now, what had Jesus just done the day before? He had fed 5,000 people. With five small loaves and two small fish, there were 12 baskets of leftovers. That's a sign, right? But I want you to look closer here at verse 31. They don't just want any sign that Jesus is the one sent from God. They want a sign like manna. They want food. So Jesus says, you need to believe in the one that God has sent. And they said, well, give us a sign then. What they're saying is, I dare you to give us more food. So again, Jesus, dealing with these people, texting him, cinnamon rolls, question mark, is going to try to redirect their attention, picking up in verse 32. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Okay, here again, he's, he's redirecting their focus away from the bread that they want to eat to the bread that he says he can offer them, which is life given from God. And they say, sir, always give us this bread. And, and really, always, the word there can also be translated continually, like all the time. So he said, yeah, right, the bread you gave us yesterday, keep giving it to us, please. They're still looking for the cinnamon rolls. But in verse 35, it gets a little more clear from Jesus. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Do I have the right one on the screen? Nope. Here. Sorry. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. First, I want you to see uh, that Jesus tells them that he is the bread that they need. Which is going to be a little disturbing because they're looking for something to eat, and he says, yeah, it's me. That's going to be a little off-putting. Okay? In fact, Jesus is going to lean into that more as we read on in this passage. But Jesus says that, that he is the bread that they need to have life. And then I want to point you to this unique construction that gets translated, I am, in your Bible. Uh, in the Greek text of John, Jesus says, instead of where we read, I am, he uses this Greek phrase, ego eimi. And there's a lot of redundancy there. Uh, it's essentially saying, I, and then saying, I am. And so it, it's, it's a little bit of a strange construction. It's not what you would naturally say in the course of conversation. But, but Jesus is, is making a specific point about himself. So he's being a little redundant. I, I am the bread of life. 
And this is an important phrase in John because it introduces these seven sayings that we have about Jesus. It is, it is really important because it is connected to the name of God in Exodus uh, chapter 3. And so God, uh, when Moses asked God, who, when I go to Egypt and, and tell them that God has told me to, to lead you out into the promised land, who should I say sent me? God God tells him in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, he says, ego a me. He actually adds another one in there, ha a me. I am who I am. Uh, so, so Jesus is using this name of God when he introduces this statement about him being the bread of life. So Jesus is not just saying, hey, I'm the person who I'm talking to you about, but he's saying, uh, I am, he's associating himself with God. He's introducing them to the fact that, that he, is, he is one with God, that he, the one who, whom they are speaking to, is the one who spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, that they are together. And this is true for all seven of the I am statements in John. Not only is Jesus telling us crucial information about who he is and what he's here to do, he is here showing a unity or an association with the God of Moses the God of Sinai. Crucially, something that I want to point out to you as we go along here is that these I am statements of Jesus almost always have a corresponding prohibition for us. So every time in John when we read Jesus telling us about himself using this phrase, I am, he always, almost always includes, so you should not as part of this statement. This is certainly the case here, as I'll ask you to turn your attention back to verse 35, because we stopped right in the middle of it, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we'll pick up in the middle of that verse to read the words that follow. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the we shall not part of I am the bread of life. Now there is a dimension of this that is immediate to Jesus' listeners, meaning you should not be hungry, or thirsty because of what I can provide. They're wanting him to provide more food, and this is the corrective. I am the bread of life, so don't hunger and thirst. But Jesus is going to take this discussion to a place where he wants to, where it's not about bread. He's going to use this physical desire of his audience as a launching point to teach about what it really means to have the bread of life, as we pick up in verse 36. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Here Jesus points out to the crowd that you are not really believing in me, so your hunger and thirst are not quenched, but the Father, he says, is going to bring to me some who do. He says, the Father is going to bring to me some who do believe, unlike you, and they will get the opposite of hunger and thirst. And for Jesus here in this passage, the opposite of hunger and thirst is eternal life. I want you to connect what Jesus says at the end of verse 35, you will never go hungry, and never be thirsty with what Jesus says in verse 40. Everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. What will it look like to not hunger and thirst? That will look like having eternal life with Christ in our resurrection at the last day. Well, his audience is not going to take this well. As we pick back up in verse 41, uh, we read, At this the Jews who were there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can we now say, how can he now say, I came down from heaven? Jesus says, stop grumbling amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father, 
except the one who is from God, only he has seen the Father. This is the first time that Jesus quotes from the Old Testament in the Gospel of John. It's from Isaiah 54, which is just a couple weeks ahead of us in the Bible reading plan. He's explaining the difference between those who have the bread of life and those who do not. Those who do have been taught by God, and everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to Jesus and believes in him. He's telling them that even though they, even though many in this crowd disbelieve him, especially the Jews here in verse 41 who are speaking disparagingly of him, even though they disbelieve him, the Father will provide some who do believe him and do receive the bread of life. Picking back up in verse 47. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. See, Jesus says it is the one who believes who has the bread of life, and having the bread of life means having eternal life. This is what it means to have the bread of life. It's not that you will never experience physical hunger again. It's not that you can go without food or drink. When Jesus talks about the bread of life, meaning you will never hunger or thirst again, he's not talking about that dimension of food. Okay? You have to connect with what he says there in verse 35 with what he said in verse 40, that the bread of life is that which gives eternal life. And he's telling the people who he's speaking to that if you eat the bread of life, you will not hunger or thirst for what eternal life can provide. Now, what would that mean for you and I? How do our lives change when we eat the bread of life? It is not that we are full for the rest of time. It is not that we will never thirst again for water. It doesn't operate at that level. Instead, when we eat the bread of life, we get eternal life in heaven with God, and that satisfies a different kind of need that we have. The bread of life will satisfy the anxiety that we have about our lives running out. The bread of life is meant to add to our human experience the dimension of a life that will continue after we die. So that when we experience our day-to-day life here, we don't have to be anxious about running out of time. We don't have to be anxious about only getting to see our loved ones for a few decades or, or maybe just for a little bit more if they're ill. We don't have to carry the burden on us of life, life's timer running out. The bread of life gives us an eternal perspective, and it gives it to us now. It's not something that we we just get to experience after we die or in God's eternal kingdom, but the bread of life is for us to eat this moment, and what it does is it solves this anxiety that we experience as people who die. It resolves the anxiety that our life isn't long enough, that we haven't accomplished enough, that we won't have enough time to do what we want or speak to the people that we want to speak to. It resolves the anxiety about us not being able to spend the time with the people that we love that we wish we could because eternal life in God's presence awaits the redeemed in Jesus Christ. Because all those who eat the bread of life will spend eternity together in his kingdom. And this is the ultimate healing factor to our anxiety about what troubles us, about what worries us, about what makes us sad. Is that our timer is not running out anymore. Is that our life doesn't have a stopping point. It has a transition into God's eternal kingdom. This is what it means to eat the bread of life. This is how hunger and thirst are vanquished. Life is no longer too short. Loved ones are no longer just here for a moment. Now, as we get to the end of this passage, 
Jesus will answer the question of how we can eat this bread of life. So he, t- he tells them, kind of, I am the bread of life, and this is what the bread of life can do for you. It can give you eternal life and eliminate the anxiety you have about death, about running out of time, about, about the brevity of life. But now he's got to answer the question of how we eat it. He's already said that it belongs to those who believe. That is true. But there's something that must be accomplished for this bread to be baked. We need to pick back up in the middle of verse 51 because we stopped in the middle there. Just after the verses on the screen, we read this in the middle of verse 51. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give, the, give us this flesh to eat? You can understand why they'd be surprised, right? Jesus is telling them they need to eat this bread, and this bread is my flesh. Here they are looking for a meal because Jesus fed them yesterday at the feeding of the 5,000, and they're hungry. And Jesus says, I can give you bread that will give you eternal life, and it's my flesh. Are you hungry? You can understand why they're disturbed. They ask them, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I want to point out something that people in Jesus' time might have had a better awareness of. All of us eat dead food. Right? Do you know that? After church today, if you're hungry, you go to McDonald's in Grinnell. What are you eating? A dead cow or a dead chicken, allegedly? Yeah, that's what you're eating, McDonald's. But even more than that, that tomato that you're eating is dead. The minute you pulled it off the vine, it began to decay. The lettuce, it was alive, but it's dead now. And if you left it on your counter for a while or in your fridge too long, you would smell it dying. Okay, even th- the bun, it was a living stock of wheat, but somebody killed it. And in the ancient world, they they were a little more connected to that process because they did it by hand. I think we're a little more connected to it here in Brooklyn, Iowa, than they are maybe in, you know, New York or Brooklyn, New York, Uh, okay, because maybe they don't have this association with food and what it takes to get it, but we know that in order for us to have food, we've got to kill something, an animal or a plant. That's what we eat, dead stuff. Okay. The people in Jesus' time would have killed it by hand. They would have cut down that sheath of wheat. They would have beat it in a process of threshing to separate the green from the chaff. They would have, have, have tossed it into the air to winnow out the chaff and separate it from the grain. They would have known how thoroughly they had killed that stock of wheat so that they could eat their bread. We eat dead food. And Jesus here has been telling them that he has a special bread that can give them eternal life, bread that comes from the Father, and it is his flesh. But in order for us to eat, something must die. Jesus is going to be very explicit about this as we pick back up in verse 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So then the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus tells them something they already know. In order for there to be a bread of life, there must be a death. We're approaching a time in our service together this morning 
where we remember the death of our Savior Jesus on the cross. Where we collectively uh, pass around elements of bread and juice to remember what it took for Jesus to be our bread of life. This is how the bread of life is baked. Jesus' death on the cross and what he did for us is how the bread of life comes into being. Jesus offered his flesh, his blood, to be subject to death so that we might receive the bread of life as our food. Jesus died for us on the cross so that we might be filled with eternity and in so doing vanquish our hunger and vanquish our thirst. Jesus went to the cross knowing that in order for us to have the bread of life that could give us the strength of eternity instead of the anxiety that comes from death, he knew that he had to die for that to happen. Jesus knew that in doing this, uh, that, that for us, by eating this precious food, that we may conquer the fear of death, that we might conquer the sensation that we don't get enough life, that we can conquer the sensation that time is running out or leaving us behind. So today, as we come to the communion table together, as we sing songs about Christ's death and, and about the elements that we partake at the Lord's Supper, I want you to know from John chapter 6 why it was given. I want you to know what Jesus tells the crowd here in John 6, that he would lay down his life so that we could eat the bread of life and spend eternity with God instead of anxiously approaching our grave, the hour of our death. It was given so that you might have the bread of life, so that you might be filled with eternity, never again to hunger or thirst. Please pray with me. Dearly Father, thank you for sending us your son. Thank you for offering his life so that we might eat from eternity. God, my prayer for us here together in this room is that you would teach our hearts the strength that comes from having eternal life with you. Is that you would provide the peace in our minds and in our soul that comes from knowing that our life isn't over when our heart stops. But that because of what you have given us in your son Jesus, because of what we eat when we partake of his body and his blood, that you have removed our hunger and our thirst and have given us eternity. Thank you, God, for that most precious gift. I pray this in your name. Amen.
Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come to your house to worship you. We thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son made, that you were willing to let him undergo what he went through to take our sins away. We thank you for this as we come to the communion table today, let us examine ourselves and repent of our sins and try to live a life more worthy of the price he paid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How beautiful the hands that served the wine and the and the sons of the earth how beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty roads and the hill to the cross how beautiful 
up your lives so that others may live how beautiful As Trey is our being passed, I'll share with you some announcements. Uh, some of them are in our bulletin today. Uh, we have Brookhaven service today at 1.30. And so if any of you guys want to be a part of that, you're always welcome to join us. That's at 1.30 in the community room at the nursing home. We just have a time of worship with our nursing home residents there. And then also we were going to have youth group at my house tonight. We we're moving that to next week because uh, we don't want to get anybody sick. <laughs> uh, so, uh, sorry, next, youth group next week. Um, uh, church work day is next week after church. And so if you want to stick around after church, there's going to be a lunch served, and then we're going to do some work projects. There's a chance you could get a little messy doing some of these. There'll be a, there's be a little painting to get done and some construction kind of work. And so um, if, uh, if you want to help with that, you may want to dress for the dirty jobs. There will be a lot of not dirty jobs too. So if you uh, don't, don't be concerned. You won't have to do dirty things, but if you want to dress in some paint clothes, then you can have a really good excuse to wear your grungy clothes to church for a Sunday, and that would be wonderful, right? Uh, so that's next Sunday, right after church. We'll go maybe until 3 or 4. Uh, there's also, next Sunday afternoon, a uh, birthday celebration for Margaret Dyer at uh, at the Brooklyn Nursing Home that we want to invite you guys to. That's in the assisted dining room, and uh, Margaret's turning 99, I believe. And somebody can correct me if that's wrong, but I think she's turning 99. And so there's a celebration for her. Her family's going to be in town, and they would love for us uh, to come out and be a part of that birthday celebration. I'd really love for you to, to be there. That's from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock next Sunday afternoon in Brookhaven from Margaret. Uh, and then I have some, uh, uh, some 4-H some Madison movers who would like me to let you guys know that the 4-H Madison movers are having a breakfast today at Manat's that goes until 1 o'clock. And so uh, I'm currently holding you back from the Madison movers breakfast. But if you are looking for lunch after service, go down there and help support the Madison movers 4-H club. With that, we're going to go to a time of prayer. It is truly a privilege to be able to to bring our cares and worries to God anytime you want. Um, and he likes listening. So definitely need to be doing that more often. Um, as we look at the prayer list, um, as Joel mentioned, we got Margaret Dyer's birthday, but we also need to keep her in prayer as she's recovering from her broken hip. And I got the joy of visiting with her last week when I took communion and saw Brian Holly that day too and she was having a real good day um, so hopefully next week she will be also and maybe later this afternoon when the, the group shows up to do the service um, and also remember the rest of the residents in at the nursing home and, and also in Grinnell um, there's a lot of folks there that need prayers uh, an update on Rachel Taylor um, she's still dealing with ALS most likely, um, and the, the symptoms are progressing, um, getting a little worse. So keep her and Wes in prayer as they deal with that and try to get in with some doctors to see if there's anything they can do. Um, that's kind of a, a guessing game with that because um, a lot of times there isn't much they can do. So um, just be with them in prayer and, and Marjorie and the rest of the family too because uh, I'm sure she's a long ways away, so they can't really do much for her, but uh, just be in prayer with all of them. Um, anybody else? Or, or the rest of the list is there? Yeah, Marsha. That's great.
That is a joy and definitely a blessing from God. Um, so we want to thank him for that. And, and I thank you guys for all coming uh, to be a part of this service. Anybody else? If not, let's go and ahead and go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, you hear our, our prayers. You hear our cares, our concerns, our joys that we have. You are with us every step of the way. We need to learn to trust you more often than we do, um, that you are in control, and you see the whole picture, and we don't. Sometimes we need to deal with things to get us to the place that you want us to be, uh, and sometimes that's hard. And we just need to realize to leave it in your hands and go forward with that. Uh, I pray that we get better at that, and I do pray that you help those that we have mentioned today deal with what they're going through and give them strength and encouragement and peace to know whatever the outcome, that you are still God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we close today? Messiah